the 11th of June 2015, NASA astronaut Terry Virts touched down in a Soyuz capsule in Kazakhstan, marking the culmination of an incredible career in space. Over two flights, Virts rode the Space Shuttle and the Russian Soyuz to the International Space Station, clocking a total of over 213 days in space and three spacewalks. Virts was also part of the team that installed the Tranquility and Cupola modules on the ISS, and during his time in Earth orbit became a prolific photographer, documenting the changing face of our home planet rotating below. This episode, I spoke to Colonel Virts about his new book, How to Astronaut, about life in zero gravity and the future of human spaceflight. Hello, I'm Terry Virts, former NASA astronaut and Air Force colonel, fighter pilot, and uh, test pilot. Uh, Terry, it's an absolute honor to have you on the podcast. Um, thanks very much for speaking to me today. Um, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, uh, the, the reason I suppose our, our paths have crossed is because, is because of the, the UK release of your, of your new book, which is called How to Astronaut. I mean, could you tell us a, bit about, a little bit about the book and, and kind of the, the inspiration behind your, your writing it? Yes, absolutely. So How to Astronaut, I've got a copy here right now, How to Astronaut. <laughs> um, I love writing. It's, it's kind of what I like to do now that I've left NASA a few years ago. Uh, my first book was a photography book with National Geographic, but this one I wanted to t share the stories of what it's like to be in space. I didn't want to write a memoir. There's a, there's a million astronaut memoirs, and so this is not a memoir. Um, and I wanted to write something that was accessible to everybody, so I tried to write it in a very down-to-earth, so to speak, way. Um, it's 51 short essays, so each chapter is, it'll take you five or 10 minutes to read it. It's, it's in small, bite-sized uh, segments. And my goal was to make you laugh and say, wow. So a lot of the chapters are things that you would expect. What's it like to launch? How do you train for emergencies? How, how do you do a spacewalk? How do you put a spacesuit on? All the stuff you'd expect from an astronaut book. And then there's a few things that you probably wouldn't expect. Um, I wrote a chapter about aliens. I wrote a chapter um, about uh, what do you do with a dead body? You know, if your crewmate dies, what do you do with their body? Um, I wrote a chapter about time travel. I, I did time travel a very small amount. You have to read the chapter to hear about that. Um, and so it, it, hopefully it's a fun book. It's, it's for men, for women, something to read on your nightstand at night or at the beach, you know, by the pool, uh, so, something that's not too dense. It's something really, I hope for everybody. That's cool. I mean, we, we were just saying there that you, um, when, when you were a kid, you were, you were, you were really fascinated in, in astronomy and then stargazing. I mean, I, I, I don't know how, how common that actually is among yes astronaut so that I can have a knowledge of the night sky but it's, so this is this the, <laughs> a love of the night sky was something that you you, you had from, a, from from when you were young yeah it's probably not super common but I was very lucky my parents really supported me um, my mom and my dad did not go to college so I'm the first one to go to college in my family but um, they still supported me they got me a telescope it was a six inch Newtonian reflector which is kind of like the basic forward escort of telescopes. Um, and I had to teach myself where the stars were, where the constellations were, how do you align that equatorial mount? Um, I used to get astronomy magazine. I, like every year for my birthday, I'd get a subscription to astronomy magazine and sky and telescope magazine. Um, they got me a, a camera, so I had, but they didn't know photography. So I had to teach myself about exposure and focal length and and it was, you had to put the film in and manually wind it. So I had to teach myself all of these things. And I think um, having to do things on my own really kind of taught me to be self-sufficient and curious and, and just make things happen on my own. Uh, so I'm not shy about trying new things. Pro I probably do a fault, <laughs> but I, I can thank my parents for, for really supporting me in that. Do you think that that's um, why you decided to to, to write the book in that way with, you know, things like time travel, just, just because of that, that sort of love of, of kind of hardcore astronomy and, and space science. Yeah. Well, that time travel chapter is really about relativity and Einstein. So I try to describe, you know, Einstein in uh, non-scientific terms, but um, uh, there's such a love of space. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I've traveled to all seven continents in the last couple of years until this year, I was a speaker. That was how I put bread on the table. But, you know, that kind of ended abruptly back in March. Um, mm -hmm. But I've, I've spoke to, you know, kids in China. They all show up with their little astronaut flight suits on. Of course, they have a Chinese flag, not an American flag. Mm -hmm. um, I've been all over Europe speaking, South America. Everybody's interested in space. <coughs> and so I just wanted to 
do something to bring that experience to everybody and not, there's a lot, there's books about space, but they can be very technical or they're kind of reserved for that segment of the population. And I, I, what I wanted to do was the opposite to bring it to the, bring it to the masses, I guess, if you will. I, I'm, I'm actually good friends with Brian Cox and I, I love the way he, um, he can communicate so well, really complicated things he can explain so that, you know, ba- anybody with a basic education can understand it. It, it, it's not though as if um, you wouldn't have had the right to, you know, or the, the kind of justification to write a memoir like that, because when you think that you, you flew in both the shuttle and the Soyuz, um, you, you sort of straddled those, those, that, that, that sort of epoch in uh, U.S. space flight, didn't you? That, that, kind of cha- that kind of change from U.S. astronauts launching on the shuttle and the Soyuz. What, what was it like being part of that, that sort of change? So it was an interesting time for sure. I love the shuttle. I'm a fighter pilot. I'm a test pilot. I like grabbing the stick and flying the vehicle. That, that's what I like to do. And when you look at the, the new, the Boeing capsule and the SpaceX capsule, there, there's no, there are controls, but you don't have to touch them. You're not, you're not supposed to touch them. You basically sit there and one day later, you dock to the space station. And so I, I feel very fortunate that I was able to fly the space shuttle. Like in space, I had my left hand and right hand on the controls and I flew it around the space station manually. Um, when we were back in the atmosphere, I grabbed it and flew it like an airplane. And that, and that was really fun. That was really great. On the Soyuz, though, <coughs> um, we were launching in Baikonur in Kazakhstan. We were training with Russians. Everything was in Russian language. It was very much a Russian culture. And honestly, I loved it. Like, I really, really loved Russia. I love the Russian people. I love the tradition. Um, I really enjoyed my time in Russia and in and have being a part of that. It was very different. Um, <clears throat> I'm American, so I'm proud of American things. And I'm glad that we finally have that ability to launch people again. But I enjoyed, I, I don't, there's, there's this sense of, you know, it's about time we got rid of the Russians and it's about time we can do it in America. And I don't feel any bitterness to them at all. We're lucky to have them as a partner because if we didn't, we wouldn't have been able to go to the space station because we sh- kind of foolishly shut our program down before we had something to, not only did we shut the shuttle down, but we also canceled the follow on, which was the foolishness. So it's not the Russians fault that we did that. It's hundred mm-hmm. percent our fault. So I, I don't blame them at all for what they were doing. And people say we were paying, you know, my flight cost about $70 million, which is pretty unbelievably cheap for a human spaceflight program. I mean, when you look at the billions and billions and billions that we spend on other things um, you know, what, what we were paying was pretty cheap. So I don't, I don't feel this sense of, you know, bitterness or whatever towards the Russians in terms of their space program. There's lots of, there's all kinds of aspects of life and politics you could talk about, but I'm just, I'm just focused on the space program. It's been a good partnership with them in that, in that aspect. Yeah. I mean, having flown on both the shuttle and the Soyuz, um, was was there much difference like physically that you feel when you're, when you're launching, when you're lifting off and eventually reaching zero gravity? (laughs) I mean, in some ways it's the same. You get slammed back in your seat and you're accelerating for eight and a half minutes. But the shuttle, especially in first stage, it had solid rocket boosters, the big white rockets on the side, which are solid rocket fuel, just like model rockets, little Estes rockets. We have those in America. Um, And when that burns, there's a lot of vibration. Um, Liquid fuel just doesn't have a lot of vibration. Liquid fuel, pushes you back with the same acceleration. So the shuttle had a lot more vibration. It was kind of this majestic, slow vibrating thing. I, the way I liken it, the, the shuttle was kind of like an American muscle car or a ca- big Cadillac or something like that. And the Soyuz is a little Ferrari. Vroom, it just uh, is up and going. And now the Soyuz was designed in the 60s as a Soviet ICBM. So they didn't want this thing slowly rising majestically. They wanted to get it on the way to America so they could blow us up and we didn't blow them up first. So that's, you know, it's not designed to be this beautiful, slow thing. It's designed to get up and go. <laughs> Plus the Soyuz has a big abyakatel. It's a big metal clamshell on top of it. So you can't see out of it for the first two and a half minutes because the Soyuz is this kind of gangly insect looking thing. It's not aerodynamic at all. It couldn't, it couldn't withstand the air loads during, li- during liftoff. So it has to have a clamshell. So you're just, you're, and to quote the right stuff, you're spamming a can for the first two and a half minutes, and then you can finally see out the window. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the other thing about the Soyuz is um, 
the fact that they, that, they, that they were only ever used once and then just discarded and they had to get another one, whereas the shuttle could take off and land. I mean, I think that's something that's, that's often overlooked is just how sort of economical the, the shuttle was in that respect. Would you agree? Yeah. Well, the, the orbiters, you know, Columbia, Endeavour, Discovery, the, the, we eventually built five. Um, uh, they were amazing. I mean, they started off as rockets. Then they turned into spaceships with airlocks and robotic arm and living spaces for seven astronauts. And then it turned into an airplane to withstand the unbelievable heat of reentry and then land like an airplane. That, that is impressive. Um, that, that was really amazing. So um, I, I was very, I'm just so happy that I had a chance to fly it only once. I wanted to fly it again, but it didn't work out. But um, I was able to fly on one of the last space shuttle missions. Um, yeah, so once you've sort of done your launch and then you're, you're actually in zero gravity and you're, you're finally on the ISS, does, does it take a lot of time to, to sort of adjust to that? I, mean, I, th- yeah. I think I've heard like a lot of astronauts actually get sick, like kind of motion sickness. Oh, yeah. So th- there's a chapter about that. Um, my one of, A funny title is uh, The Vomit Comet, Your First Taste of Weightlessness. <laughs> um, and it's about an airplane. It's a zero-G airplane. <laughs> excuse me, I have this allergies right now. It's not COVID, I promise. Um, the, the airplane pulls up and pushes over and it's going so fast when the pilots push, you get to zero G and you float for about 20, 25 seconds and then it comes back up. So that's how you can practice it on earth, but it's not the same because when you get to space and somebody turns gravity off, you know, when the engine shut down, you're floating. And then I was floating for two weeks on my first flight <coughs> for 200 days on my second flight. And on that first flight, the first two days, I had the worst headache I've ever had in my life. Um, I could only move my head really slowly from side to side. It was it was a, a painful experience to say the least. Um, but when you uh, you know on the third morning, I woke up and it was like a light switch. All of a sudden, I was fine and I could move around and it was great. I wasn't coordinated. I was still you know bouncing around and having a hard time keeping track of stuff. But I was I was able to move around <coughs> and. Uh, I had a smile on my face for the rest of the time. Then four, five years later, when I went back for my next mission, the, as soon as the engine shut down, I was good. Like my brain remembered it. So everybody, the first couple of days are painful. Either your back hurts while you're stretching out or you're sick or your, your head hurt. You have a headache. Everybody has some pain and it always goes away after a few days. Um, but the second time I did not have the, like the motion sickness, dizziness. I didn't have that at all. I was, I was, hundred percent from day one. That's really cool. Isn't it just the, um, the ability of the, for the human body to just adapt to. I, I was fascinated. I, I wrote about that in there, the, the process of learning to adapt to space because it's an alien environment. I mean, on earth there's gravity and you can't escape it for more than a few seconds. Um, and in space there's not, and there's gravity, but you know what I mean? Uh, you're weightless and your body it, it figures out how to move, how to eat. Um, it, it's amazing how adaptable humans are. That, that really blew me away. And I was always fascinated to kind of s- study my own learning curve because the curve's pretty steep and it takes weeks and weeks before you really get good at floating. Um, I don't think it would be a good idea to have babies in space. I, I'm, not a, I'm just a fighter pilot. I'm not a doctor, but I, I can imagine that would not be good for fetal development. But um, uh once you're developed, it sure is a lot of fun <laughs> as an adult. I suppose though also in a way that um, ability for the body to adapt to space is also to its detriment, isn't it? Because you start you start losing muscles and your bones start degrading, don't they? So, yeah. So there's a I wrote a chapter about that, exercising. So the Russians found back on the Mir space station in the 80s and 90s that your your bone density went down about one and a half percent per month it's a linear curve. It's so it's just a straight line. So in theory, after 65 months or so, you would be a jellyfish. You wouldn't have any bones left. Um, there was never any, the curve never leveled off and they flew one guy for 440 days when the Soviet union collapsed. Um, his ride home got canceled. So he had to wait until there was enough money to build another Soyuz. So he was there for 440 days. So NASA developed this protocol when all the international partners developed a protocol of exercise, and vitamin D. I took a vitamin D tablet every day um, and uh, exercise two and a half hours on a weightlifting machine and a treadmill and a bike. 
And that exercise protocol over a 200 day mission, I lost 0.0% of my bone density, which is amazing. The scientists were kind of blown away that normally you lose a little bit. Um, some of my bones got stronger, some of them got weaker, but my overall body was 0.0%, uh, which, which to me, the space station has checked that box. Like we know, um, we know how to live and survive and work in space for a long time. And, and, and from a strength, you know, your bones and muscles, you can come back in pretty good shape. Uh, now, radiation is a different issue. Um, I, I got to go see my dermatologist here in, in next week about my skin cancer that I, I think I got after my space mission. Um, so that, you know, radiation and cancer is not solved at all. It's not even studied to be honest. Um, so that, that's a big problem that we need to really focus on. That's a, a sort of, um, touches on another, um, responsibility of astronauts when they're up there, doesn't it? Um, the, the kind of, uh, science experiments into human psychology and uh, physiology, were, were you involved in, in many, in many such experiments? I basically, that was one of the main things I did. I was, I was a human Guinea pig. I did, uh, ultrasounds on my eyeball. There was a lot of concern about eyesight because a few astronauts have had problems with eyesight. Um, I did ultrasounds on my heart, on my brain, uh, laser scans of my eyes, infrared images of my eyes. Um, there's just a lot of stuff. A lot of astronauts do urine and saliva and blood collection. So there's a lot of study on your own body to see how, um, to see how space affects it in some ways. Yeah. So do they sort of, um, give you a, give you a proper medical checkup before you go? And then when you come back, they give you another one and then see what the difference is. About some things, yes, for sure. About uh, other things, I, I was I was shocked beyond belief. I was like, "How does how did it affect my DNA?" Because that's the concern that all this radiation is going to affect your DNA, and that could cause cancer. And they they don't know. They didn't study it. And I said, well, "Why not?" And they said, "Well, you know, it's privacy concerns, and some astronauts don't want to say." And I was kind of blown away. So I, mm -hmm. I personally, I think that's something we should be using the station for is to see how it affects DNA, especially as it relates to cancer. So for some things, they do a very good job. For others, they don't. It was funny. I was at a conference um, about two years after landing. It was I was in at this space conference in Norway, and I was talking to a scientist who did an NASA experiment, and she was doing MRIs. And I was like, oh, I did all kinds of MRIs for my brain, which actually, that was painful. That's not a lot of fun, going in the MRI machine. And, and I was having to do experiments while they watched my brain in action. <laughs> They're having a hard time finding any activity. But anyway... Um, so I was in there for like a long time and that's not fun because you're really cramped. Um, but I, we finally figured out that she was my scientist. This is, I was doing her experiment because I never knew I got back and I did my MRI and I was done. And um, <laughs> I said, well, how did I do? And she said, well, it's randomized by numbers, but if you tell me you're, so we finally, we were able to figure out. So she got her iPad out and she had my brain pictures and she's like, oh, look at this. Your brain shifted like one and a half millimeters. Like it, it literally moved in my skull. And I said, oh, my God. Well, did it shift back? And she said, Ugh, we, I don't know. They, they canceled our funding. So we never, we never oh. did the second half of the study. <laughs> so I met, I met a scientist in Norway who showed me how my brain had shifted. But I don't know if it ever came back to normal. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yeah. That, it must just be surreal. Just, just the, that, that sort of. Learn, learning that learning that about your about yeah. your body like you know i remember like i'm soon a few days or weeks after i landed on earth i i went and did this mri and they said oh yeah you got to come back at, at three months and six months or whatever and then all of a sudden it was canceled and i was i was happy because i didn't want to do any more mris but <laughs> i guess yeah. they lost their funding <laughs> so they don't know if my brain is fixed or not i mean you think they would just give them a bit more to keep them going just to finish the experiment <laughs> to, to finish it off yeah i don't know I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> uh, one of the other things actually I really wanted to ask you about was um, spacewalks, EVAs. <laughs> yes. I mean, that must be an absolutely intense. I mean, I think even even the preparation for that is is yeah. ours, isn't it? Oh, it's years. Um, yeah, there's a uh, there's a whole section. There's multiple chapters about spacewalking, putting on the suit, which is this massive, you know, two or three hundred pound, or maybe four hundred pounds. It's a it's a big suit. Um, basically spaceship. It takes a long time to get in and out of it for training. We train in a pool in Houston. <coughs> they say it's the world's biggest pool. Um, and that, uh, that is amazing. 
it's really, really difficult. It wipes you out physically. That's it's a physical workout to be in that suit for six hours. And it's, it's a, um, uh, and then when you go outside, it's like the busiest I've ever been in my life. I ended up taking more pictures than anybody. I took over 319,000 still images. And when I landed, they said, yeah, you set the record for that. There's some poor guy that has to count. And he told me that, you know, I took more than anybody had ever taken. Um, and on my spacewalks, I kept the camera in my chest. Um, in fact, there's a, there's a picture. This is at the NBL on the, the cover of the book. I don't, you can't see it on the audio version, but <clears throat> is a picture of me at the training lab, which is called the NBL, the pool. So I would put the camera in that chest pack there. So all I had to do was grab my camera, take a picture and put it back. But on each of my spacewalks, I only took about 10 photos per spacewalk which gives you an idea. Normally I would love to take thousands or hundreds of thousands of photos and do nothing but film, but I didn't have time. I was so busy. I've never been on the clock as much as I was on those spacewalks. So it's 99% work. You're plugging in cable. My, my two jobs were plugging in cables. We laid over probably 120 meters, 130 meters of power and data cables for the SpaceX capsule and the Boeing capsule. And then I was putting grease on the bolts on the robotic arm. So I was laying cable. I was a cable guy and the grease monkey. And then every <laughs> once in a while I would stop. I had a few seconds and I just rotate my body and, and look and you're in outer space. There's this thin millimeter thick plastic visor cover. And it's the most sublime thing that you've ever seen in your life. It was like I was, I, I could hear from God. I was seeing creation it was, I felt like it was something humans weren't meant to see. It was so beautiful. And then I had to get back to work because I got to plug in this next cable and I'm behind <laughs> schedule. And, you know, the, the extreme swing there was, was, was pretty amazing. Could you see Earth uh, during your spacewalk? Oh, yeah. Earth is right there. Now, you can also yeah. see space, but, you know, Earth, you're only a 400 kilometers up. You're not very far away. Uh, it's, but you can still see the, it's still a round, you know, planet. It's not, Airplane, it's just this flat thing. But when you're in space, it's not. It, it's a sphere. Um, but it's it fills your vision. In fact, some astronauts had reported when they first go out, they get they would get super dizzy and disoriented and vertigo. And I didn't think I would. I'd been in space for a few months, and I'm a pilot, and I don't get vertigo. You know, I, I thought I'd be fine. Um, in the past, the, all the spacewalkers were not pilots because uh, they needed the pilot to land the space shuttle. <laughs> um, uh, but just in case, the first thing I did, I went out the hatch on my very first spacewalk. I took a tether, which is this one meter, two meter long cable. I connected it to the handrail to the space station. I let go. So I was literally one minute outside and I'm floating in space, no hands and looking down at earth. And it, I remember it was uh, orbital sunrise. So it was still dark on the, the ground was black below me, but we were up in the sunlight and I was like, all right, I'm good. No problem. And I took the tether off and I went back to work, but I just wanted to prove to myself in those first seconds outside that I'm okay. My brain was good. And then I went about my work. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of one of the things I meant when I said, um, can you see earth? It was, I suppose earth, earth isn't always below you when you're doing an EVA. Sometimes earth <laughs> might be, might be above you because you might be upside down or it might be blocked oh, yeah. by the space station. Well, that, you know, I used to do a lot of work on my cars before, when I didn't have any money. I had to change my own oil and stuff. Um, and it's just such a pain being underneath the car, having to reach up. It's it, it's difficult reaching in an engine, this complicated position in space. In gen as long as there's room, you can just flip yourself upside down. You can put whatever you're doing right in front of your, we call this the work envelope right in front of your chest. In fact, you kind of have to, because if you, reach above a lot of astronauts rip their shoulder. They have torn labrums, which is the same problem that baseball pitchers have um, uh, because you keep this, the spacesuits not designed for humans is our joke. And, and anyway, <laughs> so if you have to move your arms, you're going to hurt yourself. Or you're not going to be able to do it. So you have to be able to flip yourself. I had this one uh, problem towards the end of my spacewalks. I was trying to connect a cable between node one and or node two and in, in the lab. And I couldn't get to it. There was a, piece there was a metal piece blocking it and I was reaching and it was so frustrating and I couldn't do it I went about the whole spacewalk and I came back and at the end I thought wait a minute and then I just flipped myself upside down boop, boop, boop. it was right there and I got it done 
So it's, it's easy to forget you can do that, but you can just spin yourself around. That's also can be a bad thing on uh, my very first baseball. The first thing I did was let go. I'm good. And then my, my wingman, the, my crewmate was outside. We look each other over. I'm good. You're good. Your tether's good. Everything's good. And then you go about your work. And I, the first thing I had to do was go, I was carrying this big bag and I had to attach it to the space station. It was like my tool bag. You go set up your tool chest before you go to work. And I'm, I'm out there and you have a tether, this thin wire that attaches you to the station, but it's pulling you constantly. It's not much. It's, I don't know, half kilogram of force. It's just a little, it's like taking your finger and just poking someone gently, constantly. And when you're weightless, even though you weigh a couple hundred kilos and that little force is going to move you. So I had this thing pulling me. And then when I got there, there was something in the way and I was confused. And then all of a sudden I was like upside down and my, my feet were sticking out into space. And it was like the most disorienting thing. And I thought, this is going to be the worst misery of my life. I'm upside down and I'm being pulled around and I don't know where I am. It was, it was a really, and I was 15 minutes into my first spacewalk. And finally I got myself straightened out. I was good. And then it was all good after that. But it was, uh, it was a few confusing moments to say the least. What does um what what does what does space look like when you're doing a spacewalk? Does it look like like the stars like you can see on Earth, or does it look different? No, I could never. So during spacewalks, I could never see uh, stars because um, during the daytime the the lights are. I mean, the sun is on, so it's you know your your pupils are that big. You you can't see stars. Um, but at nighttime, they had lights on us, so the the outside of the station has these spotlights that the ground could control and they were shining them on us. So we had lights, you know, but it's, it's like going out on your back porch at night. You can't see the stars unless you turn your, all the lights off and tell the neighbor to turn the lights off. So <laughs> being out on a spacewalk at night is like having really annoying neighbors with spotlights on you the whole time. And I, in fact, I was in London. It may have been two years, two or three years ago this month um, with Brian Cox. He does a charity event at the Hammersmith Odeon, the, uh, thing and i was we were doing a little space talk it was me and chris hadfield and chris said oh you can't see stars at night and i remember thinking chris and if you go in the cupola which is this module i installed that has seven windows um and you turn all the lights off there and you turn all the lights off in the next module next door and you turn the lights on the outside of the station and you give your eyes a minute or two to adjust there's billions of stars like you can't imagine how many stars there are there are just overwhelming numbers of stars um i helped make this imax movie called a beautiful planet that was one of the things i did uh, probably the most important thing i did in space and uh there's some really cool galaxy scenes um at the end of the movie there's this scene where you go flying into the milky way and i was very proud i shot that scene and and it's um i can't begin to tell you how many stars there are but in order to get to that point where you're seeing the stars, you have to turn off all the lights. Hmm. Yeah. And that's why I'll, I'll, I'll say this real quick. That's there's this conspiracy theory that we didn't land on the moon. Cause you can't see any stars. Well, go on your back patio with all the lights on. And can you see any stars <laughs> now turn, now turn the sun on and you can't see any stars. Of course you can't. Right. Or take the camera, even at nighttime with no lights, take the same settings they were using. Cause it was daytime and try and take a picture of stars with a thousandth of a second shutter speed. You're not going to see any stars with that. So anyway. You know, it's just that you'd uh, mentioned the uh, cupola there and um, yeah, yes. indeed you, you um, were involved in the, the installation of the cupola. And I kind of thought that was quite almost serendipitous considering that you're probably the astronaut best known for, for photography. You, you, you seem to spend yeah. quite a lot of time up there and, and snapping, snapping the earth in space. <laughs> I did. Um, my, it's funny because astronauts are different. Some astronauts are really into photography. They love it. Um, maybe a third and then a third are kind of ambivalent or whatever. And a third are just like, ah, what? they just want to go work that they're what makes them happy is doing a science experiment or whatever. And so I, I love the science. I enjoyed it, but like, that wasn't why I was there. I was there to take pictures. And so <laughs> when I, I decided to leave NASA a couple of years ago and I was like, there's stuff I want to do in life. And I've been here for 16 years. I've been a shuttle pilot and a station commander. I've done everything there is to do. Made an IMAX movie. But if I could go back and make a movie again, I would go do that. So that was kind of my my view of it was it was really important. And I, 
when I was there, they, I never had time. Like NASA didn't put time in my schedule to go take pictures. It was always like in my spare time or in between tasks or at night, late at night. That was when I did a lot of it. Uh, but it was important. That's how you share the adventure with people down here on Earth. Yeah, indeed, indeed. It's it's definitely one of the things that um, kind of makes it and articulate articulates it to the public, I think, best. Um, mm-hmm. I also want to get your, your views on wh- what was it wh- what's it like once you return to Earth? What, what's the journey to Earth like? And then w- once you once you come back to Earth, are you, are your are your limbs just really heavy and do you find it difficult to to walk things like that? <coughs> I had uh, actually President Obama asked me that same question in the Oval Office. I, we got a chance <laughs> to go there after my first flight when he was still president, um, and I was so upset with myself because I, w- I my son was a big athlete and I was I as a dad, I was coaching all the sports all the time. And I went out back and tried to play basketball with him the day after I landed. And I couldn't even get the ball up to the rim. It was like, ugh, it was so heavy. So I, and I meant to tell the president that and I forgot, <coughs> but the, the two things that I felt, and I think everybody pretty much feels the same thing is heavy and dizzy. And so, um, I just felt when I went on my first flight, I got back to my hotel room after a few hours of experiments and all the stuff you have to do. And I got under my covers and it felt like a big lead. Like when you get x-rays, they put a lead blanket over your crotch. So it felt like I had a lead uh, blanket on. And I thought I was some, it was like I was in a superhero movie (coughs) where there was a big evil guy with a magnetic ray that was sucking me down into the bed. And I was like pinned to the bed. I couldn't move. And then the other feeling is dizzy. It's just, um, you know, at, even after my first flight, it was only two weeks, but, uh, I remember the chief astronaut came out to greet us and we, we did a walk around of the shuttle. So we were walking underneath this thing and talking to NASA administrator. And I was, I, I was like, just stay by me. Cause I, I felt like I was going to fall over. I never did. I was able to, I was able to do everything, but it felt like I was going to, cause it was, it was like, you know, a bottle or maybe two bottles of wine kind of dizziness, Um, but it, it, that went away pretty quickly. Um, after my 200 day flight, it it was even the dizziness was worse. And, uh, but again, I didn't throw up. I was able to do everything. The NASA made us do these torture exercises to prove our balance. And a week after I landed, they have this balance test machine where they measure your foot pressure. So like if your if your balance is bad, your, your feet are wobbling and you know, it's like, your, your force is rapidly changing between your heels and your toes. Um, so they would, you're in a box, you can't see anything and they would move the box. And so they would see how quickly you would come back to equilibrium. And, uh, my score, you got a numerical score, my balance score a week after landing after a 200 day mission in space was better than it had been before I launched. And that blew um, me away because I, I couldn't believe it. It was like my body was designed to fly in space, you know, um, no bone loss and better balance after a week. But those like, I'm not denying it. Those first, that first day especially was super painful. That um, first breath though, when they, when they opened the Soyuz capsule mm-hmm. after you've landed in, in Kazakhstan, that must yeah. be incredible. It was the desert. If you've ever been in the desert when it rained, um, this was June in Kazakhstan. And so there was a lot of green cause it had just rained. In fact, we were worried about that there. Sometimes the rain makes these pop-up ponds. So we were worried we'd be in a pond. Um, but oh yeah, but the smell of earth was amazing. It was the desert, uh, grass living. It was life. It was like the smell of life. Yeah. Um, it, it, it seems like we're sort of on the, um, precipice of a, of a new year in space flight with regards to sort of the commercial cube crew programs and discussions of um putting human feet on mars and the lunar gateway and just just to finish off i was wanting to get your your thoughts on on all that if you can possibly sort yeah. of uh, sum up your thoughts well, on all, all that well I'll, I'll try and sum it up quickly the <laughs> there's a universal um goal of government is to keep itself in power and to keep government money flowing to the right places. Right. And so, um, and that's true for any, I'm sure the Romans had the same problem, you know, the pro council for whatever district wanted money for more aqueducts in his, uh, in his town. So in NASA is a government agency. And so the real 
objective of NASA is to bring money to congressional districts and Senate uh, districts, but which is not necessarily compatible with a really smart way to design a space program. Plus, we have these things called elections. Our founding fathers cursed us with elections and congressional districts is my joke. And so every four to eight years, it's very easy to change directions. And that happened um, in, in 09. It was particularly bad where we canceled. We were already canceling the shuttle and then we canceled the follow on program. And so that led to kind of a decade of wandering in the wilderness. So we need to figure out um, in the West how to have a strong, flourishing democracy with being able to fund a space program over a long term between multiple political parties. And that's true in Europe, but it's especially true in America because America is kind of the big dog in the space world. Um, and so I, I think we're doing that. I think this private, uh, public private partnership where companies like SpaceX and Boeing and others can, we, if we can figure out how to get the money, give them direction and help them where they need help and then just let them be innovative. Um, I think that's where the hope is. Uh, they can do things for much cheaper than a traditional giant bureaucratic government program would be. Um, when you look at some of the programs we have going on now, uh, the Orion and the SLS, uh, you know, we've spent tens of billions of dollars on each one. They were both born back in 2005 and it's, they're still years away from their first flight. And so anyway, the, the, the cost and expense of those programs is just not sustainable. And given what happened in 2020, the amount of debt that we've taken on in America, I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same in the UK and Europe, but in America is, is trillions of dollars of extra. We were already burning a trillion dollars debt, which was a mistake before the pandemic. And so there's just not going to be a lot of extra money to spend on government space programs. So we need to figure out how to do it cheaper if it's going to happen. Now, that being said, um, <laughs> what? Well, I had a chance to speak at the White House two years ago at the National Space Council, and my message to Vice President Pence was, um, it's not about the rocket science, it's about the political science. So, you know, if we can figure out how to do it, then I think we can, we can do it. But we need to use the private sector for sure. Fantastic. Well, I think um, that kind of look, positive look to the future is, uh, is where we'll end things uh, today, Terry. I just yeah. want to say thanks very much for speaking to me. And also good luck with the book, you know, again. And, Thank you. Yeah, I understand that you're you're, you're sort of doing a, a tour of the, of the UK to, to promote the book. Oh my gosh! Well, the unfortunately, 2020 happened. The the publisher had me set up for a 20 city um, book tour, um, and that which actually it turned into a Zoom tour, which for me personally was a lot easier. I, that would have been a pretty rough travel schedule. Um, that's the kind of th I actually I could a Zoom tour of the UK would be very easy. I, I would infinitely prefer a real human tour of the UK because I love I love going there as often as I can but um, I think uh, I think for now we're limited to zoom so it's a it's a fun book like I said it's a great Christmas present it's um, hopefully it's a fun and and not it's not your not your father's astronaut book <laughs> I'll say that <laughs> Okay, well, th well uh, th uh, thanks again, Terry, and um, yeah, and, and enjoy the rest of the, of the virtual book tour. Yeah, thanks for having me on. This is great.